<laughs> hello, hello in UK Health Radio Land. I'm Liz Larson and I'm here with my friend Bill McKenna. And you guys, if you're seeing us on video, we are both in the same location on the planet today. It's a rare event. And we are the hosts of the New Life Perspectives radio show and also the duo that created the Cogno Movement System. And today we have a very special guest. His name is Don Oscar Miro Quesada. And he is the author of a newly published book, Shamanism, Personal Quest of Communion with Nature and Creation. Welcome, Don Oscar. Aim punchao warmicha waikicha, Liz. Beautiful. De todas maneras, I will speak in English to allow an interpretation of what I have to say in a manner that is going to be nourishing to the English speaking audience that you serve. So, uh, ordinarily, I would begin with a prayer in Runasimi, in the mouth of the people in Quechua, which is the indigenous language spoken in the Andes of Peru, from where I was born and raised and had my formal apprenticeship in. Kamaska Kuranderismo, or folk healing, shamanic folk healing, as well as Alto Misayuk, uh, uh, earth honoring uh, ritual shamanic arts in the southeastern part of the Andes, with Don Senso Rojas Palomino, my primary mentor, and Don Benito Coriwaman Vargas, my secondary mentor. Beautiful souls that are now on the other side of the veil, still influencing and directing my service work upon planet. And it's an honor to be with both of you and uh, look forward to exploring the many dimensions, multidimensionality of what the shamanic path is about. Well, we are so excited to have you here. And we know that off camera, you told us that you're actually the author of a couple of other books and the founder of something. Would you tell us about that? Well, uh, yes, I, uh, I'm the founder of the Heart of the Healer, T-H-O-T-H, Thoth, like the thrice great Hermes Trismegistus. That's the acronym mm -hmm. for that, Shamanic Mystery School. And it is an organization dedicated to disseminating what's known as the Pachacuti Mesa tradition of cross-cultural shamanism, P-A-C-H-A-K-U-T-I, Pachacuti, in Quechua, or the language of the Andes, of our indigenous ancestors, means pacha, world, space, time, place, consciousness, and kuti, reversal or change, transformation. So pachakuti means world transformation, personal reversal, flux, evolution, change, growth, and refinement of one's soul's presence on planet, ideally, to the point where you feel that you can heed the call to be a light based on the power of love upon planet to transform those fragmented conditions that people are experiencing into states of wholeness, beauty, and grace. So it's a ritual practice that is very, very ancient that I've incorporated and teach across the world to many students that are practitioners of the Pachacuti Mesa tradition of cross-cultural shamanism. If you're interested, go to heartofthehealer.org and you will find a plethora of opportunities to explore this fascinating world of cross-cultural shamanism. Wow. This is so this is so interesting. I, I'm filled with questions. Uh, you know, the first question is, you know, it's so interesting that you brought up Hermes Trismegistus, right? And um, was that a part also of this Peruvian Andes type culture way back in the day? Was that part of their whole thing or did you bring it in? I integrated that, that aspect of the great work because... I find the phenomenon of shamanism very useful, especially in our current era of, uh, <clears throat> of dissonance, of emotional, mental, spiritual, physical, and soul dissonance. And since shamanism is all about working with our soul vehicle, with that in the Andes we equate soul with consciousness, with awareness, 
it's fundamental to have some mystery schools and hermetic traditions, Gnostic teachings that draw from Western, Western origins, because most of the people that are waking up to this path are of developed Western nations. Uh, they are doing the work of seeking initiation as adepts of that path. So therefore, the hermetic teachings of the thrice great are very relevant. That's not to say that before our recorded history in those times when the planet was first star seeded by our ancient ones from the celestial realms, that hermetic teachings such as that offered by the thrice great weren't available in the collective newosphere in the consciousness of our planet. Yet, uh, the fact that I've used it as part of the curriculum that we offer is really an adaptation. It's not uh, autochthonous or original from the Andes, for sure. Maybe a continuation, it sounds like to me, you know, a continu continuation of the work. I have a question that we ask a lot of our the teachers that come on our channel. Bill and I uh, really believe that right now healers are being called, awakened, in, in huge numbers. And Bill and I are teachers of a large group of people. And what we find is the people that are coming are so ready, so fully educated, big backgrounds, amazing humans. Do you find that that people, one, are being called in great numbers? And also, do you find that the kind of people that are being called are a bit different than ever before? I'll respond from my own personal experience, which is really the only right I have to, <laughs> to speak about these things. Um, in the early days, everybody came to these apprenticeship series for personal healing. They were wounded. They were broken. They, had, they, they felt alienated. They felt disenfranchised. And they were seeking to heal that within themselves. And what they found was that as a participant in a sacred community, that healing was even amplified more. So being part of a family, what we call an Ayu, a, an extended spiritual community that really cares, loves, and accepts the person exactly for the way they are. They understand that they're enough just being who they are. They don't seek to change them or modify or fix them is a huge medicine in their lives. Over time, and I'm talking in the 80s, 90s, uh, when this was still prevalent, the focus on personal healing. Since the late 90s to throughout the 2000s, like you say, uh, Liz, yes, I noticed that it's going from the personal to the planetary. There's a much greater movement of people who have done their work, that have, you know, done their inner plane work, they're taken their inventory, worked out their shadow stuff, and been able to rise to a place where they want to be of service. And we find now much more earth regenerative, uh, Pachamama, Santa Tierra focused, initiatives than the actual just need to heal one's own self. And I have always said that um, one's efficacy as a, as a shamanic healer is directly proportional to one's freedom from self. The more you can let go of the craving for control and approval and um, design your life based on how you are going to survive or your closest loved ones are going to survive, uh, the more you can let go of that narcissistic self-absorbed need, the greater your opportunity as a light to shine in the world. And I find that many more people are being called, especially those people who have been through severe challenges and hardships, dark nights of the soul, in which they've been brought to their knees and have surrendered totally. And at that point, they realize that it's not in their own individual effort, but in the larger collective planetary species-wide evolutionary drive to align with that and support it in whatever way they can. So I do find this very exciting times to live in, regardless of all the challenges and perils and pitfalls that we may be experiencing, it's all grist for the mill. 
Yeah, we really, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think we we couldn't agree more. The people that we are coming in contact with, they've gone through tremendous uh, loss and regain themselves. And exactly like you're saying, so much is already out of the way. It's like the path was cleared. And what shocks us day after day is their capacity to take big ideas and concepts and things that I think people would take a whole lifetime to learn. They're learning so quickly and incorporating it and creating more out of it. It it is astonishing to watch from, from our perspective. So I'm so fascinated about your shamanic journey and your trips to Peru, these sacred sites. Would you share with everybody, what is your opinion about how that expands consciousness? What do you see? Well, um, there's a few ways to address that as well. Uh, Three ways on the level of self, on the level of culture, and on the level of nature, right? (laughs) So... um, At the level of self, I feel that it's vitally important for people to have an opportunity to get out of their comfort zone, to leave their country of of origin or residence and expose themselves to a foreign, different land and and people. It is the best university that there is on planet. Travel and communion with the actual living soul of a... um, of a tradition or of a culture that is not other than one's own. Uh, and therefore, the, the pilgrimages or the uh, medicine journeys to Peru and to other sacred sites of the world that I've been facilitating for, since 86 are a fundamental part of making that available to people on an individual level. That said, we reach a point where a culture starts to create, and by that I mean an ethos, a sense of identity. And so therefore, a, 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 a tribal mindset, not in terms of protection and, and, uh, and you know, self survival, but a, a tribal in terms of communion with a larger living sentient universe or multiverse in which in the shamanic sense, our stone relatives, our plant relatives, our animal relatives, our two-legged relatives, and those seen and unseen denizens from visionary realms make themselves present as our guides, as our allies. So our culture is created around that, which is so much richer than just an individual genealogical ancestry or historical culture on planet. And then, of course, becoming one with Gaya Pachamama, merging with the wisdom and the sentience and the extraordinary richness of the heart of our mother. We understand, that's why we call South America Heart Island. North America is Turtle Island, Central America is Serpent Island, South America is Heart Island. If you look at it from above, it looks like an anatomical heart a little bit, the land mass. But most importantly, it's the people of the land of the condor that have openly shared their traditions and teach love by the way they live. And that is the the medicine most needed, shamanically speaking, on our planet. I've always said that more than saving, our Earth needs loving. And that's the planetary level. So true. You know, that fifth dimension really is that heart center, that heart place, the fifth chakra. Why don't we take our break here? We need to hear from the good folks at the UK Health Radio Network. And when we come back, maybe we can talk a little bit more about those adventures into that heart island. So UK Health Radio, take it away. All right. Yeah. So everybody, when you you listen into this, and and uh, I know for some of you around the globe right now, you're thinking, you know, like he's talking about rocks and stones and the earth and you know, that they're living and you're like, wait a second, you know, I got rocks in my garden and I don't know about that. They don't seem to be doing much, but you know what? There's actual science behind this now. There was a, a man, uh, uh, Dr. Cleve Baxter, 
And Dr. Cleve Baxter, I believe he, uh, I think he got his origins in the CIA. Maybe it was the FBI, but he was the original person that did polygraph. And one day, uh, Dr. Cleve Baxter got a little bored and he was like, you know, he's kind of one of them creative minds. And he took his polygraph system and he hooked it up to the house plant in his office. And, you know, it was just like, I want, that's, you know, I wonder if anything's going on there. And he hooked it up and, well, nothing happened. There was nothing going on until he, he said, you know what? I know what I'm going to do. I am going to burn the plant. And he got out his lighter and he was like, I'm going to go over and burn that thing. The plant went nuts. It was, you know, the whole thing went nuts. And he was like, oh, my gosh. It's responding, and it's aware. It has consciousness. There is an awareness. And he was like, oh, my gosh. Well, he decided to start doing all kinds of experiments. He would take a uh, little shrimp, live shrimp, and he put a, he put a um, they call them pseudo number random generators. It, it basically is a random number generator, so you don't know when the event will take place. And what he did is he let the timer figure out when it was going to boil water. They put a pot of water underneath the shrimp and then and kind of a release mechanism where the shrimp would drop into the boiling water. Well, he had the he still had the house plant hooked up and and uh 2 a.m. You know, he's monitored, he's got all the scientific instruments to monitor everything. All of a sudden, you know, the water starts boiling at 2, 2 a.m. And, you know, whatever, 2.20, clink, shrimp falls in the water, the plant goes nuts. It's like, oh my gosh, there's, you know, destruction, right? Murder of the shrimp. The shrimp are conscious, the plant is conscious, Everything is conscious. So for those of you, I just wanted to bring it out that, you know, um, what our friend here is saying is was known to the ancients, but now the science is starting to catch up. It's actually true. And if it's true, think about it. If everything is conscious, then that means you're affecting everything. You know, you want to know why your day doesn't go good and you, you, you know, check yourself. Are you, you feel a little bit spicy and you wonder why you're getting treated like that or why things are falling apart around you? It's conscious. It's aware. And, you know, uh, Don is on the cutting edge of this. So I just can't wait to hear more of exploring this consciousness, this, this reality that he spent his life helping people into this broader awareness. So how did you get there, Don? Well, in response to what you just said, my good brother, it's all done with mirrors. <laughs> yeah, right. Yep, right here, so baby. As self, as self, so the world. Yeah. Right. So, um, <clears throat> well, my journey has been... Uh, quite unusual in the sense that I spent my most formative years uh, in the bush. Uh, my father worked for the National Public Institutes of Health in Peru. So from age about a year and a half till before I started kindergarten, uh, we lived in very remote rural areas in tr with tribal communities. So I was exposed to the indigenous soul very early on and to the consciousness that comes with feeling that knowing that you are an integral part, an interbeing with the rest of the sacred web of Pachamama's dreaming. And so therefore it was a mythic reality that I was exposed to, not a reductionistic scientific reality. That said, coming from a family that was highly focused on rational discourse, I ended up going to university and as a matter of fact, 
decided to go to my undergraduate at Duke University because J.B. Ryan was there, the founder of American Parapsychology. And I met Hel Helmut Schmidt, the creator of the random event generator that you just mentioned. Oh, really? Oh, my God. He there went at, at the Psychical Research Foundation. So, I, you know, I've dabbled in a lot of, I've attempted also to give some um, empirical uh, foundation to the more mythic experience that's associated with shamanic healing service, right? And therefore st have striven to, um, to integrate that within the body of teachings that I've created over the years. So there's a lot of scientific substantiation without becoming reductionistic and saying, oh yes, it is this. Because over the years that I've been doing this work, I've realized five axioms, if I may say. The first axiom is that consciousness begets matter. And by begets, we mean it's generative of. It structures it, it informs the material world, right? I'm sure we all agree with that, especially though you two that have done such incredible work with the subtle energy fields of people, right? In, in your uh, Cogno movement uh, service. And then, uh, the second axiom is that language begets reality. So consciousness is a priori for the material world to even exist. Then language, the words we use, results in the reality that we experience. The third axiom is ritual begets relationship. Everything you see in the natural world is a form of ritualized behavior, and it creates bonds of, uh, of union and, and, and service to each other. And it's a cooperative emergence of life that is based on sacred relationships among all species. The fourth is that <clears throat> nature begets purpose. The natural world, if you just observe it, look at the amount of incredible research that's being done in biomimicry and how that's applicable to technological advances in today's postmodern uh, world. It's, it's vital for the development of scientific modalities to improve our lives, to, to adopt what nature has done and mimic it, right? So nature begets purpose. Observe nature and you will find your purpose as a human being. And the fifth is love begets life. Capital L, love. The ability to experience deep, compassive feeling. As a matter of fact, my own, my own experience is that shamanism emerged from the first human impulse to care for something or someone else as much or or more than oneself. And love is behind it. That's where the medicine is. Oh my gosh. Wow. I want to, you know, you know, I'm going to be hitting, uh, I'm going to be going back and listening to this again. That was a wealth that, that was such a wealth of, of, uh, information, uh, that I, I loved it. Love begets life. And, and, you know, something I'd never thought about, Liz, was that um, uh, ritual, uh, uh, having everything to do with relationship. Isn't that interesting? You know, it's actually something that we say in a little bit differently, because our work has to do with the nervous system and how we have automated responses. And, you know, I do this. So you do that. You do that. So I do this, you know, back and forth, round and round. We'll have the same conversation a thousand times, the same argument generally that ends in the same place, but put in the form of ritual, it has different meaning. It really does. And, you know, Another thing that I want to agree with that you're saying as you're as you're speaking and you know we're in the practice of putting ourselves in a position of radiating that love and one of our discoveries was that the physical body actually has each of us in its own unique individual place a, a neurological place where it begins that radiation and we can move into it but what you're talking about I think is that that radiation of love can be ritual if we put it into practice 
And also the opposite can be true. The less yummy stuff can also feel like ritual and and turn out in a negative way. Do I have that right or am I confused on this with um, what you're saying? No, it, I, I mean, I, I rock you clearly, sister. <laughs> uh, the, the, of course, in, in a universe that is based on ones and zeros or or dualities there's always going to be that left side and the right side right it's just the way it is until we through our own apotheosis our own divinization into spiritual light no longer need to experience that polarization as a being and and that that takes many many incarnations as you well know uh, we're, we still have a few more worlds and other planets to inhabit and check out before we just merge with the with source. Yet, uh, from a pathological perspective, yes, there's very harmful rituals. I can think of yeah. being a, a clinical psychologist myself. I can think of hundreds of, of rituals that are very destructive to body and heart and to mind. Yet. The types of rituals we're talking about is with a capital R. They're rituals that sanctify and beautify our lives, the lives of others, and most importantly, our relationship with the earth. So they lead to a sense of reverence. Mm, so, one of my favorite words. <laughs> yeah. and, and so in the shamanic way, performing a ritual is always an act of reverence. It's mm. an expression of gratitude. It's an expression of of generosity of self and therefore it becomes in, in, it creates a morphic field and, and therefore it creates a body that radiates outward that same level of equilibrium stability and balance between heart and mind and therefore it serves as a healing salve uh, for anybody who is exposed to it done over time that ritual becomes a lineage and that lineage becomes a new way of living as a human culture as a planetary culture rather than just as nationalities or you know ethnic backgrounds or divisive divisory types of <laughs> uh, boundaries that are not necessary to truly evolve as humankind as a whole so yes, um, Terence McKenna, the, uh, the psychonaut, some of you may know him, had a, a saying because he worked a lot with entheogens, with uh, plant sacraments, mm -hmm. to help expand one's consciousness and enter into communion with a much wider experience of what it means to be human, right? But he had a, he had a saying, choose your tripping partners well. And by, by that, it's like, and, and we're not talking about ingesting LSD and stuff like that. We're only, we're talking about that choose those people, those allies of the great work well as to who you hang out with. If you do that, you're going to avoid a lot of deviations from the path. It's so easy to forget who we are when we decide to choose associates or friends that um, are still stuck in fear, you know, still s stuck in self, um, self torture. It's so true. Back to what Bill was talking about earlier, you know, that plants pick up on even just the subtle thought of a person, good or bad around them. We, we there's science with that. We know that we affect each other with our field so greatly you use the word subtle energy body or energy field i don't think it's all so subtle we really interact with each other and as a group we start to harmonize our vibrations harmonize and so often we create a medium of the median of the highest and the lowest vibration well if you choose somebody slightly higher and slightly higher in vibration, you tend to merge with them as a collective. But the same is true if you have somebody with a really low vibe that you're keeping in your circle, you're going to drift that direction as well. So I think that is some of the best advice I've ever heard. And you put it so beautifully. 
you know, be careful who you choose, especially if you are reaching for that overarching sensation of love for self, for the planet, for the universe. You've got to be in a space where you can radiate that more often than not. And being around higher vibe people really, really, really does that, I think. I mean, that's something we surround ourselves with. I mean, just our practitioners are the most incredible people. And we leave a meeting with them flying high, literally flying high. I love to tell the story about going to the store after a cognitive movement session or after a a meeting with our practitioners. And I'll walk by people and they'll say, oh my gosh, you're glowing. You know, or wow, you look so beautiful. I mean, random people. And I really haven't done anything special with my hair or none of that. It's just that I'm radiating the love that I have also experienced and received. It is the best thing ever, I think. Yeah, it is. And look at Don. Yeah, he's you know, beautiful. He, isn't he? He's, a, he's that is a You know, vibrant, healthy. You can feel the love coming off him. So for those of you who are just on listening to UK Health Radio, go on YouTube too and check him out. My God, what a beautiful man you know it emanates <laughs> it emanates through you it emanates it's all done with mirrors it's, it's all, all done with mirrors <laughs> it's it's namaste it's the principle of honoring the divinity in you that resides in me and uh, and realizing that we are divine beings and, and making i have a little saying that goes like um it says <clears throat> Gratitude fuels generosity, which opens to grace. Gratitude fuels generosity, which opens to grace. So the simplest practice that our our friends that are listening can do is every morning before getting out of bed, before opening your eyes upon waking from your nighttime, just open your heart to being grateful for whatever experiences will come along that day. Source, great spirit, creator, creatrix, whatever you want to give a name to the one, invoke it in your heart and start with an expression of gratitude for whatever. Go about your day. And at nighttime, when you lay down, close your eyes, do a little day review, uh, go through over the events that occurred that day and realize even the ones that were most challenging and difficult and almost contrary to what you sought to achieve were great teachers and be grateful for those as well. And so you go into your dream time being grateful for that. Starting and ending your day that way is a common practice among cross-cultural shamanic peoples. Their dream times are are treasured, as you well know. Dreams are very important modes of receiving information and guidance. But most importantly, to prepare and to go into that dreaming when you're still awake in the morning and the nighttime are vital. They frame the experience so that the dreams can become lucid and more informational and guiding. I love that. Now, now I, I gotta I gotta back you up here for a second. He, our man here, if you weren't listening to that, listen to that one carefully. What what he said, he just went right into it. But the practice of reviewing, reviewing the day before you go to sleep, and then when you get up, the gratitude, all those practices that he just said. It has this strange phenomenon of creating an avenue for lucid dreaming. And and one of the great things about lucid dreaming is across, you know, all these traditions, right? The Toltecs, the Aborigines, I'm probably I'm sure the, the Peruvians. And if you control dream time you control this reality. So there's a huge benefit to it. As you start to be able to act in the dream the way you want versus it happening to you, you can really do positive, more positive things here in waking life. So this is a really valuable tool that he just gave us. 
Yeah, it's really beautiful. And uh, you can't believe it, but we are up against our next break. So we have some gorgeous words from the UK Health Radio Network. We'll hear from them. And when we come back, hopefully we'll get to hear a little bit about those visits to Peru and uh, communing with the land and some of the beautiful things there. So UK Health Radio, take it away. Okay, and we're back. Uh, You know, I just want to piggyback on what Bill said. That um, ability to tape edit at the end of the day or even at the beginning and review the beauty in each person and even some of the things that we might consider negative about a person. When you can be in that state and actually have compassion and love for every piece of even the people who aggravate you, even the tough ones. Should, hey, what, <laughs> hey, what just happened? What just, what just happened there? Projection. You're right. <laughs> even, right. Even, <laughs> thank you, Don. You thank know, you. Even if you, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic, you run the store, but that ability to see and just flip it into that space of love and have compassion, it is so beautiful. It softens everything and puts you in that state of gratitude. So I really love that practice. And do you know, I didn't know that that was something that indigenous people did around the world. I, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing in, that. In different ways, they all uh, ado- have adopted a similar practice and they teach that. I'm talking about sm- tribal societies n- n- that are still unadulterated by Western contact or influence, which are very few and sparse but they that's a very important we have a saying in the shamanic uh, path that when you're sleeping dream your waking dream or your reverie and uh, i mean and your wake your, your sleeping dream your reverie or or fantasy and your waking dream which is this three-dimensional experience of of physicality when they have all the same elements in them it means you're living your medicine you're really walking so there's really no separation between a dream uh at nighttime or a dream during the day because when you are in that in-between space you are fashioning the world through your imagination through contact with the imaginal the archetypal realm and at that point, therefore, it matters not to define a dream as lucid or, or prosaic or mundane. They are all good medicine for the soul. And we seek to live the dream and fashion the world according to that love that is our birthright. As a teacher, do you uh, find yourself teaching? all night long, we often will find ourselves doing the same work that we've done during the day, but throughout the night. Do you ever have that experience? Well, having, having had uh, three near-death experiences, and oh. that still won't take me. <laughs> I'm still bound to the earth. I've, yes, I'm going to just say yes. It's, it's, it, it's continuous. Seems like it, doesn't it? Oh, that's great. That is great. Three near-death experiences. My gosh. And you're still here. Yes, because when you're dead, you're alive. More alive <laughs> than when you were not dead. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's just maybe that. That's part of the glow that we see, right? They, they weren't. It, it, you mentioned early on about me being the author of other books. The other book that addresses this in detail is my first book, Lessons in Courage, Peruvian Shamanic Wisdom for Everyday Life. All these are on Amazon and if and or other preferred booksellers you can get. In that, I go through two of my near-death experiences that were pivotal in landing me where I am now in my service work. Uh, one resulted at age 10 from a, about a severe hypoxia because of a, asthmatic conditions and a miraculous healing took place with some shining ones in my room and the other took place when I was 33 years old as a result of an auto accident when I was going through a very difficult period of my life where I was you know, denying the sanctity of myself and, uh, and not treating myself that well. 
And so it resulted in a major crisis and a, you know, turning over my driving to great spirit, which resulted in a fatal accident. I came back. And the third one occurred when I was two and a half years old as, a, as an electric shock. That I still have the, the scar. My father told me about this when I didn't remember it until he nudged my memory. But I was two and a half and he brought me back. So I've had those three, two and a half, 10 year old, 33 year old experiences of crossing the veil. Wow. Lo and behold, when I ended up taking a teaching position at the State University of West Georgia, guess who my uh, uh, office mate was? The eminent, eminent Dr. Raymond Moody. The oh my God! Wow. We're very, very good friends as a matter of fact. Oh, so, so yeah, it just blew my mind that I, when I was in that middle experience of trying to integrate my last near death, because they can be very destabilizing these these events, and um, that I end up finding that my room, my office mate was the the most renowned uh, NDE researcher on planet. It was it was like almost someone was something was orchestrating that meeting for sure. Oh, clearly. Yeah, no, no right. coincidence. I mean, yeah, yeah. Coincidence? No. Wow. Wow. You know, it sounds like you've had a, a pretty wide academic career. What brings you back into the shamanistic, into the the South American heart? What brings you back to that? And and um, I don't know if it's, is it away from the academic or are you blending them? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's been a journey as every everyone's life of experimentation, of self-discovery, of of remaining open to what life has to bring your way. And so therefore, uh, when I feel most myself, capital S, is when I am around my indigenous ancestral peoples of the Andes, coastal and Amazon regions of Peru. It just, my soul feels like it's home. And that's really, I pay attention to that because that feeds me and nourishes me and keeps me um, full of meaning because it's so easy when you look around the world to say, oh, it's not worth it. I'm not going to go ahead and pull my weight and do uh, the small little things that I can do to make this world a better place. But having an environment and a contact with people that live, the, the, that understand that our earth is a living, conscious being and that their soul and the planetary soul is in sacred union in a sacred marriage that is sustaining the cosmic dreaming, the swaha, the cosmic mother's breath as a whole. And there's no separation between self, other, planet, and cosmos. That is something that you'd have to be crazy not to make your North Star your guiding light in life. So the best way I can answer it is that when I'm in the shamanic uh, dimension of my indigenous ancestors of the Andes and other places of the world, um, I'm home and, that, uh, and I want to be there. <laughs> you know, that really makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. It really does. And in the Western culture, our culture, we live in the U.S., um, we do feel so separated, I think, most of us, not only from culture, but from each other. And I think so many don't understand the connection with the planet, with the plants around us, that we really do, our love or not love has a massive effect on even the walls around us, the floor beneath us, the table in front. So, what would you say that is? Why do you think we in the West, in the States, have lost that, where many of the people in your home still keep it, still have it? Is it the connection with family? What do you think it is? Well, it's, it's, it's 
Um, <clears throat> yes, it's all of that and more. It's um, the Western occult trade psyche is fascinated by making things easier, right? And so we are bombarded with opportunities to make our lives easier. But what happens is that we try so many things out simultaneously that our lives become much busier and less easy. And therefore, it continues. There's this spiraling estrangement from the sacred dimensions of life every time you order something from Amazon to be delivered to your home. It, I mean, that separation itself of not knowing the origin of what you're ordering, of not having been sanctioned by a tribal, by a family that's necessary for your life, without it being something that can have a utilitarian value beyond your own usage that can still serve seven generations in the future if you're not around, all of these things aren't taking consideration. So it's our forgetfulness of our interdependence that is creating this situation in the world right now. And I have, I have another saying that goes something like, when we surrender the need to figure it all out, and cultivate the ability to let it all in, then our earth walk becomes a sacred dance of healing service in the world. More than the earth needs saving, it needs loving. And that's the way I best can describe what, what my medicine path is at this point. I wonder if, um, I was having this discussion with um, a, a woman who speaks Russian and as her first language, but she also has learned Huna Hawaiian tradition. And we were talking about how in the English language, we just have one word for love. And in uh, so many other languages, there are many, many words. Do you think that's part of it that in the Western culture, we just have a different understanding? Maybe we don't have the words and the capacity to understand what love of the planet might be love of the surroundings, radiating love for others? Any alphanumeric language that is noun-based is at a disadvantage to even being able to convey an experience that approximates the love that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, I would say, for instance, in Quechua, we, it's an onomatopoeic language, meaning it's a language whose sounds imitate the sounds of nature. So oh. it's a verb-based language. So it's an action language. So you're talking, but you're, it's the ing, you know, the, it's, it's always a verb. It's always a, an action. The words are always about, for instance, Kakyarayu, lightning bolt, is like the descending, it really means the descending of luminous power from the above into the earth, fertilizing the ground and returning to the above. Wow. You hear, you hear that one word and you live that experience, right? Yeah. Same with the word munai, which is love, M-U-N-A-Y. It, then they, you have kuyai, which is deep caring, a different type of love. And then you have this taki, which is a, a form of agape, or, uh, or excuse me, a form more of a filial love. So you have various expressions of love within the, the language of the, of the Quechua people, the language of the Andes, as well as many, the, the, uh, the, Dan, the, the uh, Sanskrit and the Aleph Beit, the early, early uh, Jewish language, you know, of the 22 consonants, they're living languages. So we have these, these remnants from a time when we had no writing, but we spoke. And what we spoke became imprinted as a mnemonic return to our origins as children of the earth. So therefore, we remembered our stories of origin rather than had to write them down. And by remembering them, we lived them and passed them on to future generations through our own courtesy. So and beautiful. That's, that's the way the shamanic tribal uh, medicine way has survived, regardless of attempted eradication for over 3,000 years. Oh, oh, oh yeah. 
But right. Doesn't that make sense of, uh, that you're seeing a whole picture in a sentence? So I can't believe it, but our conversation is one minute from de- being done. Would you please just let everybody know how they can find you one more time? Want to make sure everybody can reach out if they want to. Thank you so much, both of you, for opening up the space to do this. And uh, it's the heart of the healer, the heart of the healer.org that you can find out everything that I have to offer and that our family of practitioners has to offer online classes, in person apprenticeship programs. And if you would be kind enough to you know, check out shamanism, personal quests of communion with nature and creation, and leave a little review that helps spread the good medicine in the world. And uh, thank you again for allowing me the space to be myself. Oh my gosh. What a, what a great, what a great discussion. Everybody out there, get all of his books. You're, you're, it'll be the best money you spend. You know, talk about a wealth of information and a wealth of consciousness lifting material. And not only that, you do, you do tours down to. Um, I, I don't have any, any plan for this year because of other um, responsibilities. We're creating a little center in Costa Rica that I need to attend to. Uh, but in 2024, I'll resume taking uh, eth- what, what I call ethno-spiritual uh, pilgrimages to ah. the Andes of Peru and Bolivia. Beautiful. Peru is in a, in a difficult state right now, too. Ah, okay. All right, everyone, please reach out to Tadon, find out more about him. We're so grateful for this conversation today. It was really, really beautiful. It was so lovely to meet your face in person. And everybody out there in UK Health Radio Land, Bill and I will see you next week. Until then, be safe and be well. Mm